egos and self-worth wrapped up in the perceived success of our shows, we know firsthand that receiving a one-star review can, at times, be the most traumatising experience in a person's life. I don't even like them all. I prefer La La Rue leggings and my essential oils. But these kids wouldn't shut up about, let's go to the mall, Karen, take us to the mall. So what am I supposed to do? These aren't my kids. Their well-being is not my problem. Welcome back once again to the space window for what is sure to be the worst podcast in the world, The One Stars. This has nothing to do with the movie Space Jam. I love Michael Jordan, and I've always been a fan of Bugs Bunny, basketball, and aliens. I set the gun down on the merry-go-round, turned my back for like 30 minutes tops, came back from the slide, and it was gone. Just gone. (laughs) No clue what happened there. But that's actually what led me to your product. The One Stars is a good point podcast. From what we gather is something emerged from the dwarf star Pyresias and presumably tore apart the golem. The energy signature of Tiresias changed significantly at 6.43 set time. At that point all telemetry cut out. We do know that something left a large amount of organic matter in its wake. A trail of an ashy substance can be found leading from Tiresias, past the Gorlin and onward out of the solar system. All data was corrupted beyond recovery and this symbol was found repeatedly all over the station. I know it. I remember. It was there in Eden. I'm sure of it. The reluctant, immortal Adam Delta V must defend the very structure of the universe whilst confronting his past. Do you remember? No, you do not. You are close inside. Where are you now? Where is your true form? Sailing through the void. Searching. For what? Inside Adam Delta V. Inside. Chain of Being, a mythic sci fi podcast. Listen now, where all good podcasts are found. My name is Marty Hatchet. Friends call me Dennis Lunchtime. You can call me whatever you please. Just don't call me a liar, because I'm trying to save your skin here, youngin'. How do I know all this about this tree, you want to ask? I know more about this. You're getting it. Here. Available only on Channel 34 Sketch Comedy Radio. Available anywhere you get your podcasts. The New Colossus is a completely unhinged dark comedy reboot of Anton Chekhov's classic play, The Seagull. Content warning. The New Colossus audio drama is rated R for content. Episodes contain explicit language, lust and sexual situations, gunfire, death, dysfunctional conversations, illness, bad theater, anti-patriotism, drinking, and arm wrestling. You'll laugh. You'll cry. We hope you enjoy The New Colossus. Hi, this is Bob Ramunda, one of the members of the team bringing you the Podtails programming you just listened to. Podtails is committed to free, accessible programming to explore and celebrate the art of creative audio fiction. That means our live panels are captioned and ASL interpreted, the episodes in our podcast feed have accessible transcripts, and all our programming is free. But in order to make that happen, we need support from fans, creators, and listeners just like you. If you can, the best way to help Podtails grow is through a monthly contribution over on our Patreon page. Any amount that you can offer gets you year-round access to our Discord server, early access to episodes, updates from Podtails HQ, and more. Check out the goals on the page for some cool plans we have coming soon. Head on over to patreon.com slash podtails to make your contribution today. Help us keep podtails free and accessible and help us celebrate the incredible world of audio fiction. Again, that's patreon.com slash podtails. Thanks.
Is our little guy's fucking 67 years old? For Doesn't he have long arms? Oh man, he's got this <laughs> Have you ever listened to the world? I mean, really listened. Just stopped and stood still and listened intentionally. What do you hear? Birds? Traffic? Your loud upstairs neighbor having a solo dance party? Some people can hear the buzzing of electricity, even over other sounds. That's pretty cool. As for me, I never really thought about it much. I could hear, so I could hear. Nothing special about that. I guess if I had to choose, a sound I've always liked is the sound of a dinner party. People chatting, silverware clinking. You never know when things will change. Or how they'll change or how that will change you. Seen and Not Heard, an audio drama about hearing loss and deaf gain, is available wherever you find your podcasts. And this thing is going to actually shoot out three ciphers at you. 37. That's 88. I think he's rolling on the real table. That's 25. He said he was going to use the book for one thing and one thing only, this chase. This is what happens. The field of view just narrows intensely, and all of you can see 10 times further than normal. Well, because you're adjusting to this, you can only see 10 times further than normal. It's like looking through binoculars. Ah. Oh, the headaches. Yeah. The second thing is that the tarp catches on fire. And the third thing is you can all hear each other's thoughts oh, as no! you all unanimously scream. That's my daughter, Hopper Scotch. Oh, <laughs> 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 is this just permanently thinking that at any point in time? Is it the first thing Ellie thinks here and, and seeing 10 times more than normal? The first I was gonna say, Hopper, like, his first order of business is that he and Ellie are both still right next to the now flaming tarp, so he's gonna try to handle that. But then he would hear, that's my daughter, Hopper Scotch, and he would think that Sarah was there, so he would be, like, looking around, like, is she here? I can see ten times farther than normal. So, <laughs> it's just a lot of things happened at once. Quest Friends, a podcast about friendship, family, and a statistically unlikely number of surprise daughters. Transcripts and recommended first episodes can be found at questfriendspodcast.com slash about. Paris, 1699, a time of civil unrest, non-hair-related salons, and the most innovative stage magic ever seen in a union house. You know, I don't know if you can tell, but the excitement is palpable out there. Historically, no one's seen any... The show's about Lamarck's vanishing box. I remade Lamarck's vanishing box. Nothing could go wrong. All right? All right, punch it. Twins, 12 years old. Kids, the mission isn't a game. You're right. And it's a mission that you can't meet alone. You need help. Besides, these aren't just any children. They are fabulous. Oh, same excuse every time you have chores. Oh, well, you'd probably like this one, Alexa. The main character's Puerto Rican like us. Take back time. American soldier Lieutenant Horacio Mendez is fighting a war on a foreign shore when he's pulled through an interdimensional portal into a time storm. Ah, uh, how cool is that? I don't do interdimensional portals. Whoa, that storm sure is close. Bueno, I'm just glad you're not scheduled to fly a plane in this. Can we turn on the air? You know the rules. No air conditioning after <sighs> Labor, Labor Day. Day. When I was growing up in Puerto Rico, we just cranked Crank open, open the, the window. window. We're in agreement then. Yes, I'm summoning Alexa and Benito Ventura into the time storm. Time storm. Time storm. Time storm. Oh, 
begins. Benito and Alexa Ventura, tremendous! You can travel in time and whenever, wherever you arrive on Earth, you'll exist alive as can be. You can help me. No, we can't. Horacio said we both have a choice. You can choose to stay and I can choose to go without you. Oh, right. You fly around in some other century. I'll hang here, wondering if you're ever going to return. Benny. You're finally ready? The mission isn't about being saviors of a culture. It's about preserving and raising up what's already there. You'll need to redefine what it means to save history. Witness. Witness. Find. Remember. Podtails is committed to free, accessible programming to explore and celebrate the art of creative fiction podcasting. That means our live panels are captioned and ASL interpreted. The episodes in our podcast feed have accessible transcripts, and all our programming is free. 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 But in order to make all of that happen, we need support from fans, from creators, from listeners like you. If you can, the best way to help Podtails grow is through a monthly contribution over on our Patreon page. Any amount that you can offer gets you year-round access to our Discord server, early access to episodes, and more. We have some really exciting things planned. Head on over to patreon.com slash podtails to make your contribution today. Help us keep Podtails free and accessible and help us celebrate the incredible world of fiction podcasting. Again, that's patreon.com slash podtails. Thanks. The universe has an eternal heartbeat. It's not wrong, you know, to need somebody. Maybe you needed me too, maybe you just, you just did not ask. Each pulse quiet and across remote dimensions. If I had my sword, I would run you through. (laughs) You would find that the most difficult task of your life. And you're lost. Though seldom heard. When a beat sounds, there can arise. Now, a single, deep breath. (sighs) Center your mind. I can't. Yes, you can. A strange love. spent 500 years protecting this forest from humans. From your kind, I kept this island human free. Come to me, oh what fun. My kingdom spreads within this. I am a secret king. <laughs> My silken thread Their jaws and teeth became material, so they could tear at their prey. Round and round, never leave. Father, I I know you don't want me here. I walked west of the sun for your touch. Do you believe in grace? I walked east of the moon for your kiss. I loved, and for a time, I was real. Strange Love, an audio fiction anthology series. Fantasy, sci-fi, macabre. Written and produced by William J. Meyer. Listen on Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, and strangelovepodcast.com. People think we're weird. So everything's okay? Mami, calmate. I'll be fine. We both know she's fretting about you, but I've been telling her. 
our baby girl is going to thrive. Aw, Mom. <laughs> I promise you guys, I have my telepathy completely under control. Dane's Inferno seems really dark. It's basically a tabloid with poetry. Weird twist, but I'm listening. Well, I have to pay for school somehow. You know, my offer still stands. Not this again. Here's the thing. I kind of do want to tell you, but... Hey, no pressure. You don't have to tell me... My parents passed away two years ago. I can't let myself slip like that. Again. It's none of my business. I remember what freshman year can be like. You're still in college! I'm in my senior year. It's different. <laughs> God, I wish I had better control. Tell me about it. I'm worried about you! Quit it! I said I'm fine. I would do everything you do if I could, but I can't. How do I make this right? So, yeah. My first semester of college is going... great. I got this. The Path Down. A sci-fi audio drama about grief, privilege, and superpowers. Okay, I think this is working. Um, uh, hi. You're listening to Soundstage, theater for your ears, and new anthology coming to you from Playwrights Horizons. We're a nonprofit off Broadway theater in Hell's Kitchen, New York City, and we're committed to the advancement of contemporary American playwrights. My name is Adam Greenfield. I'm the theater's associate artistic director. And, um, okay, so I thought I was going to be recording this introduction in a studio somewhere, gearing up for like a splashy summer release of this series but instead I'm sitting in my clothes closet in my apartment in Brooklyn working from home uh, in this new socially distant reality recording this into my laptop with a mic that I didn't even know I had which I found in my basement but if you're like me you really miss being at the theater right now which is why we at Playwrights Horizons didn't want to wait a second longer to release this series but are instead rush ordering this over to you with my recorded in a closet introduction. Um, Soundstage is a new program of our theater and it will continue long after this COVID-19 crisis, but we felt like the moment to launch the series has to be right now because until we're able to gather safely in a theater again, we're determined to continue our work to bring artists and audiences together. So um, we started making these recordings a little more than a year ago, as committed podcast listeners ourselves, we were thinking about the new explosion of audio as a medium, and we started to get curious about what the inventive, adaptable, rule-breaking, genre-busting mind of the contemporary American playwright might bring to scripted audio storytelling. We started by commissioning a handful of writers, specifically trying to build the rangiest anthology we could imagine, written not to be recorded live in front of an audience, but instead to be something that's native to the digital medium, written specifically for audio. Each piece is uh, vastly, dimensionally different from its comrades in the collection. We use theater directors, theater actors, and theater designers, and we're really delighted by the way it's turned out. The first four pieces you'll hear are a lush musical mass composed by Heather Christian, an anthemic spy thriller written by Robert O'Hara, a mind-bending participatory new theater piece written by Jordan Harrison, and a collection of cutting room floor interviews with his parents written by Kui Gwen. And we have additional pieces that are in the works by Lucas Nath, Milo Kramer, Kirsten Childs, Jenny Schwartz, Carlos Murillo, Kate Tarker, and Jeremy O'Harris. It's been an awesome ride making this series. I mean, we're a theater company. We make plays that happen in rooms with people. Uh, we didn't really know how to make stuff like this. So yeah, there was a big learning curve in making these. It was a process that was full of surprises as we learned how to do it. But it has been truly a blast, and we're excited to share them with you. We hope you enjoy listening to these as much as we enjoyed making them. I've seen you prodding the rim of a behemoth skull inside a dream you don't remember. 
excavating calcite layers of secret and lie. But despite your caution, the object of your searching Welcome to Podtails 2020. I'm Alexander Danner, the director of Podtails. We are so excited to be putting on programming devoted exclusively to imaginative audio storytelling throughout the month of November. Today, we'll be treating you to the panel Creation During Crisis. Uh, this is our very first live virtual event, and we're so pleased that you're joining us. At the top of this program, we would like to offer a land acknowledgement, a statement that pays respect to the indigenous people who live here and who had their land stolen from them by colonizers. It is only the very first barest step that we can take to, that we can do to support indigenous people today. The following acknowledgement of what to keep in mind as we participate in this digital space is written by Adrienne Wong of Spiderweb. Since our activities are shared digitally to the internet, let's also take a moment to consider the legacy of colonization embedded within the technology, structures, and ways of thinking we use every day. We are using equipment and high-speed internet not available in many indigenous communities. Even the technologies that are central to so much of the art we make leave significant carbon footprints, contributing to the changing climates that disproportionately affect indigenous people worldwide. I invite you to join us in acknowledging all of this as well as our shared responsibility to make good on this time and for each other to consider our roles in reconciliation, decolonization, and allyship. Next, I'd like to thank all of our sponsors. They are major contributors who helped sustain Podtails 2020 and allowed our show to continue virtually this year. Learn more on our website's sponsor page. Podtails 2020 is completely free. We believe in making the resources we're creating available and accessible to all. If you like what we're doing here and you have the means, please consider supporting us on Patreon at patreon.com slash podtails. ASL interpretation for this session will be provided by Brandon C. Kazen Maddox of Body Language Productions. Learn more about Brandon's work at brandonkazen-maddox.com. Please feel to use the chat feature here on YouTube to say hello and ask a question of our panelists today. I'll be keeping an eye on the conversation and we'll pose a few of these questions to the group before the end of the hour. And now I'd like to introduce Jeff Randreessen, the co-creator of Greater Boston and my partner in creating Third Sight Media, the production company that hosts Podtails, a festival of audio drama and fiction podcasting. Jeff also sound designed and edited the second season of Fan Wars, The Empire Claps Back, a rom-com rom podcast about fandom written and directed by Shanae Howard. He is also an award-winning playwright and published fiction author and has been a college educator for nearly 20 years. He'll be your moderator for today. Take it away, Jeff. Hey, everybody. It's so good to be here. I'm so happy to be the first moderator for the first panel of Podtails 2020. And I have the honor and privilege of being here with these amazing inspiring guests who I'm about to introduce. And before I introduce them, I just want to give a quick note that I stole something from the wonderful human being, David Reinstrom, who was the former host, current executive producer of Radio Drama Revival, who does this little thing about asking people about their favorite fruit as <laughs> part of their introductions. And I just love it so much that I stole it shamelessly and asked all the um, panelists here their favorite fruit. So that's going to be part of their introduction. I just love it because it's just a really small little human thing that connects us, I think. So um, first up, PJ Scott Blankenship is a writer, actor, director living in Columbus, Ohio. PJ's first audio related role is as the voice of Greg in the actual play podcast, Join the Party. Since then, he's gone on to create the audio drama Hit the Bricks, which is the Podtail Showcase episode on November 30th, by the way, and co-created Phantom Wise. PJ's favorite fruit is lemons. Jeffrey Gardner is a director, audio artist, and engineer. They are the executive producer and the founder of Heartlight NFP, which produced the eight season award-winning audio drama podcast, Our Fair City, and the critically acclaimed Unwell, a Midwestern Gothic mystery. Jeffrey is the mastering editor for Rusty Quill in the UK, including such shows as the Magnus Archives and Stella, Stellar Firma. And they teach audio at Northwest, Northwestern University where they earned a master's degree in sound, art, sound arts and industries. 
Their favorite fruit is either pineapple, pears, or cherries. They can't decide. They just really love fruit, and that's okay. Yanni Smith is an award-winning filmmaker, writer, producer, folklorist, film festival, film festival founder, and nine-time Lower Manhattan Cultural Council grant, Council grant recipient. Yanni began her artistic career working as a dramaturg, assistant, script reader, and development assistant in the theater. She also has experience in film and television production, working with directors such as Spike Lee and Joe Pitka. In 2019, Yanni independently produced and launched Harlem Queen, an audio drama based on Madame Stephanie St. Clair, the numbers queen and patron of the Harlem Renaissance. Yanni was born in Hampton, New Jersey, the blueberry capital of the world, and now calls Harlem her home. Perhaps not surprisingly, Yanni's favorite fruit is blueberries. Richard Senek is a New York-based writer, director, and producer. He started his career in acting and later shift his, shifted his focus to writing. Richard's most recent work is the fantasy podcast series Visionaries Audio Drama, which is also a podcast, uh, a podcast, sorry, Pod Tales featured episode in our showcase. I forgot to write down the date. Sorry about that, Richard. He wrote, directed, produced, and released season one to all major podcast platforms in early 2020. Richard's favorite fruit is cantaloupe. I forgot to say that my favorite fruit is a really nicely ripened um, uh, peach. I forgot to mention that. Sorry. I feel like it's only fair to sort of include mine as well. So now that the introductions are out of the way, I really want to thank everybody again for participating in this panel. I'm really thrilled that you're all here. You're all creators. I respect and admire tremendously, and I'm really excited to have this conversation with you. Before we begin, I have to acknowledge that we received some news in the media today that I think we were all expecting. Obviously, we're here because this has been a very challenging year for several reasons. Um, and I don't want to minimize the tragedies that we've seen, um, and they are pluralized, not just within this last year, but for several years. And for many of us, they're they're more palpable than others. And there's there's a huge kind of you know grief that we have to process. At the same time, we all need, I think, a little bit of joy, and just to express and feel a little bit of joy. And for me personally, I might be alone. I am feeling just a little bit of that today. And it feels like the first glimmer of hope that I've had in a long time. There's just a release of pressure and a little feeling of joy. So I've asked everyone here if we can just start this panel by just making a sound, a happy sound, a sigh, a cheer, whatever it is. I'm going to give a countdown. I'm going to ask everybody just to make a sound. I've asked, I'll ask everybody who's watching the panel to do the same. Take a deep breath. It doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter if it blows the audio. Just make a sound. All right, here we go. Ready? One, two. Three. Oh, oh, it's a team. Thank you. <laughs> that feels so good. Okay. It really good. It's really good. <laughs> it's really good to hear everybody's too, I have to say. Um, thank you for indulging me with that. I'm going to ask our first question. Uh, so I want to know what you all view as your responsibility as a creator to respond in times of crisis. Is it to entertain? or to escape? Is it to confront the reality that we're being faced with and you know, face up to the work we need to do? What do you, what do you think? Um, let's start with Yanni. Oh, okay, thank you. I just want to say thank you so much for, I'm very excited to be here today. Like I was saying earlier, this was like Pod Tales last week, last year, uh, set quite an impression upon me. And I was uh, very much looking forward to being here today. And I admire all of my fellow pal panelists today. Um, so the question, um, yeah, so I'm so nervous. I wrote down some notes after to get my glasses. So um, as an artist, yeah, I think our responsibility is everything that you stated, Jeff. I think that it is our responsibility to entertain, challenge, um, as well as um, maybe be an escape for some people. But I also think that kind of entertain and escape is kind of similar in that respect. Um, it's always, I aspire to um, provide clarity, educate, entertain, and uh, I understand that's a lot to aspire to, but um, as a and as an artist, as a creator, but that's what um, I that's what I live for. That's why I feel like I'm here. What I'm here to do um, over 
the past, maybe when the city opened up and museums became available, the first thing I wanted to do was go to a museum. And I didn't realize until I couldn't go to a museum, museums, how important art was for me to provide me with um, perspective, um, language for what I'm feeling, affirmation, um, as well as challenge me a little bit. And so I feel that it's very important as an artist and what I have taken on more seriously as a result of the past several months is my responsibility to um, sh share that with my audience. It's really interesting. One of the one of the last things I did before the pandemic hit was I went I took a trip to New York and I went to a museum and I'm so grateful for that experience because it's been it's been tough to have that connection since. Um, other folks, let's weigh in. How about Jeffrey, if you don't mind? Sure. So um, I, I think this is a really this is a really good question. Um, when working with HeartLife, um, we have worked very hard to be very purposeful about how and why we make art. And that's both about the experience for the um, the audience, which is you know obviously a huge piece of what we why we make art, but also about the experience of the artist. Um, and I want to talk about uh, the we we have we've created kind of three pillars of how and why we make art. And I want to talk about the third one, which is uh, we call it uh, stories, open space, and culture. I am uh, a you know a politically active person. I think that my art is intensely political, but I would not call it political art in that I don't I don't actually know if by listening to a piece of art that I make someone will go from thinking, you know, one thing to another thing. I do feel like making art, making it intentionally and being very aware of what kind of social mores you're emphasizing with your art has the space to kind of open space for people generally to shift culture. We, by telling the stories we tell by being very purposeful with what we are telling and how we are telling it, we give other people opportunities to shift the culture. Um, and I think that's that's super important. And so I think I think the responsibility is to always be uh, always be questioning why you're making choices why you're doing things certain ways, not just, oh, this is how we've always done it, but say, okay, why why do we have the, this process of casting roles this way? Why why am I, am I making this choice to uh, portray this person in this way? And to both analyze it for ourselves and also to to listen to other people in our artistic communities when, and, and, and invite them to criticize and uh, contemplate it with you. I really like the idea of thinking about it not as, from an individual artistic, you know, push to change anyone's mind, but as a collective kind of answer. Because I, I think that it's it's naive to assume that like, although it's lovely and I, and it's not like I don't want it to happen to think that one person or one piece of art can create this tidal wave of change, even though in the back of my mind, there's always this desire to do that. But I do agree that if if you know if we just chip away at it as a collective we can actually do not only a lot of good but you know we could we can do some serious good so i i think that that's i think that's touching and moving and honestly one of the reasons that keeps me up in the morning um <laughs> pj sorry you had to unmute uh this one it's 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 complicated and it's difficult because if you had asked me when i was a little younger maybe early college pre-college days i would have said that the creators sole responsibility is to create. And it's not necessarily their role to be um, a champion or an advocate for anything other than what they're creating. But now, of course, I'm a lot more educated. I've gone through a lot more. I've seen a lot more. I've been made aware of certain privileges that people who have the ability to create, because I mean, let's be honest, to be actually able to sit and make something full time is a sort of privilege that a lot of people don't have. There are plenty of creative people in the world who would love to be able to mount full shows who just can't. And I certainly can't on my own. 
So, you know, being able to work with other people has been a huge boon that other people don't have. And the older that I get, the thing that I try to reconcile the most with myself when it comes to creation is the pursuit of truth. And in my mind, that intersects with everything that everyone else is talking about. The, the push to being more communally responsible, the push to check privilege, but also to get out of the way and let what you're working on be a microphone for other people to relay a truth that's not self-evident to people like yourself. Being able to weave in other perspectives, being able to pursue something, even in a fantasy space, and ground it in, in reality, and that reality being other people's truths and being able to understand each other is probably the most important thing for me right now. And also to create, for me, what I would want to see in the world, which is a sense of comfort and understanding um, from places that you wouldn't necessarily expect. Um, it's kind of a, a quick answer, but that's, that's no, how that's, I feel about it. That's perfect. And I, I had a similar experience when I was younger. I, I very much was just like, art exists to entertain. And you know, if it says something, that's nice, but that's not the reason for it. And over time, um, I've changed and learned a lot. And I, I, I think it's crucial now, especially that answer about the search for truth, when we're living in an age where there's deliberate misinformation, exactly. <laughs> um, which definitely was a factor in this year of crisis all over the place. Um, you know, I think it's really important for that to be a sort of centerpiece of what we try to do. Richard, love to hear from you too. Um, I'm going to kind of piggyback off of what everyone said. It was great answers. And just to kind of add on to it, um i kind of feel like the responsibility as i've you know like i guess developed more as an artist the responsibility started to weigh a little heavier in a good way because i think there is something in being able to embed your message through your themes of your whatever it is whatever creative art form you're going with and it's not only from the artist's perspective that it's satisfying to put that message out there, but I think sometimes it can be the tool to reach across the aisle, whatever that aisle is. You know, sometimes a message can, uh, can come across a lot easier through forms of entertainment. Um, so I think if you can do that, like there's so many ways of speaking your truth, so to speak. Um, it doesn't have, there's no right or wrong way of doing it. And if your way just so happened to be doing it through writing, through filming, through drawing, through painting, is vital to put it out there and especially since it is going to be unique in its own right so no one else can be a carbon copy of what your ideas your vision so maybe now more than ever with everything that's happening we do need it we need to hear we need to see all different perspectives and what better way of seeing it than through your art or at least one of the many ways so i do think the responsibility is there but it is a good thing and it's it's going to collectively bring i think a lot of good stories fresh perspectives, just things for all of us to take in and uh, appreciate. Yeah, one of the things that people ask me for advice all the time, like how do you how do you start an audio drama? What's the what's the biggest thing you can tell me? And the first thing I always say is just do it. Just do it. Don't worry. Okay, I didn't know what I was doing. Alexander and I didn't know what we were doing when we started. We figured it out. We learned. But the most important thing is trust yourself. If you have a story you want to tell, tell it because that'll guide, that passion will guide you. And I think that's the biggest piece of advice um, I can give anyone and for anyone to internalize, it is important to get those perspectives. Um, so at the, at the start of this year, when the pandemic hit, I'm going to get a little personal. I'm going to talk about my own kind of journey as a creator this year. Um, I, you know, when everything first happened, my anxiety, I'm a very anxious person. My anxiety was like, that's it. We're going to work through it. You're just going to create more and <laughs> do more stuff. And everything else will be in the in the background, right? And so I start I started like three podcast proposals. I was like, we're gonna make all the podcasts. Like this is this is this what we're doing now. Um, that didn't last for long. I, I kind of hit a wall, and I I got really kind of. It was hard for me to do anything. It, I, once I, I hit that wall, in the wake of the, all the sickness, the death, the institutionalized racism, fascism, homophobia, transphobia, I could go on and on. It didn't feel like whatever I was doing mattered or it was worth it. It didn't feel like it was enough. And I'm curious if anybody here wrestled with any similar thoughts and how you sort of managed to sort through them. Um, Richard, I'm gonna start with you this time. We're gonna go backwards. Sure, uh, yeah. I So after I released uh, my uh, Visionaries, my podcast, like I started writing in April and that was like the height of 
of at, at least with the pandemic, right? And I was in New York, so we we got hit really bad. And like you, Jeff, I was just like, you know what? I'm gonna write like ten thousand hours. I'm gonna have everything ready to go. And a couple weeks in, with the death, with the injustice, it just weighed on on me so heavy that there were days I just felt paralyzed, so to speak. I'm not even trying to like stretch or anything. And um, it was my first time really feeling anxiety to 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 such heights and that sense of uncertainty. Um, and, you know, it took a while, but I think what helped me was a sense of routine. And I think that I had to like go into this, into writing, into this creative space and just like build it piece by piece, block by block and kind of get used to it. And it helped me actually having that thing of routine because everyone's routine got interrupted. No matter, you were either planning something, you were preparing for something, you were waiting for something, everything just got interrupted somehow. And I think that um, that establishing that routine started off slow and it was hard, but just kind of like trying to fight through. And every time, just like, you know what, let me write a little more, let me do this. And eventually it started coming back up as we used to have when we were going to work or visiting family members or, you know, like going on trips. I think creatively that that came to a halt for me too. And I had to just kind of work my way back up. So that was that's what helped me. And just telling myself, it's okay, we are in the middle of a pandemic, like, you cannot write today, and it will be fine. It is not the end of the world, because I can't speak for everyone. But there were a lot of times where I'm just like, I should be doing much more. Why am I not doing this? What you know, like, I should have eight drafts by now, and I only have this amount. Uh, so that that helped me. And then at some point towards the end, I got to a comfortable place where not not everything is the same again, but I think that small routine just became something I can rely on and, and helped me get through. Because I'm sure like you guys, I just, I do love writing. Just everything that was happening was overwhelming to say the least. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's so important to acknowledge, um, first of all, that this is un these are unusual circumstances and to give yourself a break. If you're not producing as much as you usually are, um, and you know, that's, that's something everybody should feel like they, sh they should just acknowledge because it's absolutely the, the truth. Right. And just to not be down on yourself. And there's also, there's two, two kind of parts of that. For me, it was both the creative aspect and also just sort of the, the, you know, social issue aspects. <laughs> like there was so much pressure I felt to do more in, on, in that regard. Um, and I tried, but you know, similarly, it's hard to sort of manage everything you need to do, especially when your routine keeps shifting and changing throughout the year due to everything that's happening. Um, th that's really good advice. Thank you. I, I think trying to establish that routine is something I'm going to try to do more of once pod Dells is over, <laughs> I can kind of try to do that. Uh, PJ. Um, it, it's, it's funny because the, the pandemic of course is a huge roadblock if you'll pardon the pun, in, in the production of our show. But the crises that we faced go back so much further, if you guys are fine with me, um, sharing a little bit more about what the time before the crisis this year. Um, we didn't actually start producing the show until 2018, and it didn't really get up on its feet until the pilot was finished in august of 2018 and around that time a bunch of health issues hit me pretty hard and i was hospitalized twice with kidney stone related stuff i ended up being fine but because i'd been there so long uh i totally hit my deductible and at the same time like bankrupted myself so the show like the the pilot was, was produced and then i totally ran out of money and i had to move back home for a while and then about a month after i moved home to live with my mother, my mother um, suddenly passed away from a heart attack. And the following year in 2019, everything changed. Um, you know, I didn't have anywhere to live for a long time. I was in a bunch of legal battles over estate stuff. She didn't have a will or insurance. So things got very difficult for a long time. And we'd had the successful Kickstarter and the show that was just hanging out, waiting to be made. Um, and I, about a year ago, I finally settled everything down, moved into my new place on my own. We finished the first season. We were going to do a half of a season and another half with a break in between. We produced the first half and the show finally got up on its feet and we overcame a bunch of other things. And we launched in January of 2020. 
and the show was all recorded. It was just a matter of producing the episodes and sound designing them and finishing them up. And we did one a month. And after, right after the second episode came out, COVID hit the U.S. really hard. And so we had this backlog of episodes and, and two already finished. And, you know, our show has a lot of people in it and a lot of people involved in it. And a lot of people put a lot of effort into it. And I was just, I was beside myself. You know, my co-creator, Chad, was just like, well, we, got to, we have to keep doing it. We have to go. And I'm like, this is farcical. This, everything is, is, is falling apart right now. How on earth can I be like with my dog and pony show being like, well, it's the end of the world as we literally know it, but here is a 40 minute episode of a show that we made. And I'm, it, it was very difficult for me. Um, something that I, I kind of came back around on that helped us continue to produce the show was that like we'd already put so much work into it. There were a lot of people outside of ourselves that had worked on it who deserved to see their work actually be put out in the world. And it was, it was just interesting, you know, the first half of the show when we were producing it, it was like my internal struggles working their way out. And then now with, with the pandemic, it's the world of the outside creeping its way in and, and just kind of um, killing everything for us. But being able to talk openly with your cast and your crew and your team and the people that are watching or listening to your show, it's, it, it's really helpful to get their perspective because what you're making it was important enough for you to put the effort into it and getting back and remembering why these things are important to you. Um, th those things don't change, crisis or not. And getting back to those basics of why am I making this, is, it's a good way to kind of power through the struggle. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for sharing both, you know, what happened this year when you released Hit the Bricks and also just the background of your own personal struggles, because I think it's important to acknowledge that we don't live in a bubble in this year. Sometimes it feels like it does. <laughs> this year is like self-contained with its own series of very bad events. Um, but for one thing, a lot of the bad events that are happening now are systemic and are tied to our history and our past and all sorts of things. And then we're all struggling with our own personal kind of issues that uh, our own crises yeah, on top, like it's a scaffold, scaffold and it's really difficult to manage all of that. And I'm very sorry that you had, you know, a really hard time in between, you know, the Kickstarter and launching the show. And then when you launched the show, you faced this, that feeling. And I completely understand it and, and sympathize with you completely, but it's a, it's a beautiful show, I will say. So you, you're, you're doing good work um, thank and you. thank you for doing it. Um, Jeffrey. Yeah, so I, I I kind of feel like I have a number of different directions my brain is telling me to go on this. Uh, bouncing off of what Richard said, it's 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 interesting to me. I am I am not a writer. Uh, I am primarily a director in my artistic practice within audio fiction, and so um, for me the the pressure has much less been like, uh, and the the struggle with especially with COVID has been, how do we do this thing that um, up until now has always been intensely personal and, and, you know, done in very close uh, insulated spaces. Um, how do we do this safely? Um, for me, it's, it hasn't, hmm, the question has never been justifying how I can do this for myself, but how do I do this thing in a way that is safe for everyone around us? Um, and we've worked very, very hard. Um, we've published all of our kind of um, uh, during quarantine um, uh, production guidelines through Heart Life NFP. Um, I guess what I'm what I'm getting to is that continuing to direct and continuing to work with the actors has been important because I see how important it is to them to be working. Um, not just, you know, obviously in like, uh, it, it is a way to put food on the table, but um, finding ways that our actors can feel safe uh, to come into the studio or to work remotely and be able to have, you know, those three hours where they just get to focus on the craft, where they get to make their art and where, where we can provide um, a safe space for them to express themselves, themselves artistically has been a really beautiful opportunity. Um, it's been a really great way to be kind of in community with these people who 
I have been working with in some cases for two or three years, in some cases for 10 or 11 years um, for some of the folks who have uh, been with us all the way since the beginnings with our fair city. Um, ways to reconnect and provide support for them. And that's been that's been what a big piece of what's been keeping me going. Um, I, oh, no, 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 please go ahead. I just want to say it, this this answer makes lots of sense for both you and for Heartlife, because I consider you, yourself and Heartlife like leaders in a lot of ways. And so it's just very comforting, one, to know that this is what you're doing. But also, I really appreciate and I'm always grateful that you release everything that you're, you're planning, like whether it's everything that you organizationally create, you're like, hey, if others want to emulate this, whether it's how you're recording now with everything happening or if it's safe, safe space like guidelines, you're just like have access. And I think that's that's the sign of a leader. And it sort of fits like what you're talking about, how you're kind of lifting others up and letting them sort of do what they need to do because it's good for them. So thank you for that. Oh, I, absolutely. We're really we're really happy that we have the opportunity to share those resources that either we've made or that we have um found from other people and kind of synthesized with other things. Um, I would say the other big thing, and it's it has really struck me uh, in part um, today and, and through this election cycle is that finding space for yourself to have a joyful activity is so important to fuel the other work that you're doing. Because, you know, I while I think that the art I make is political and has political effects. It's also one of the ways that I keep myself going for the direct action that I do. Um, and 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 no matter what, what political action looks like for you, I think it's also really important to make sure you fuel yourself um, so that when you're getting out there, when you're, you know, if you're doing phone banking for the election or uh, if you're doing legal work, um, that you you maintain that fuel for yourself. Uh, for me, you know, <laughs> I'm not good at calling people on the phone, and I'm not even really good at texting people. I am good at standing still in front of people who are angry at me and making sure they don't, you know, move past me. And so, like, that's 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 what my work is, and. And being able to, you know, do hours of that at a protest or a rally and then um, come home and, and center myself with artwork uh, allows me to go and do that again. And um, I, could sh I, I could theoretically do twice as much if I cut out the artwork, but I think I'd be able to do it for a quarter as long, you know, over the grand scheme. And this is not the this this fight is not. A sprint. This is not even a marathon. This is an intergenerational handoff. And so <laughs> I think we need to not, you know, exhaust ourselves so that we can't keep fighting. That is a perfect response, I think. And also it reminds me of something that both you said when I, I was cutting together the sort of pod tells interview sections that we're putting on the feed from various creators. One of my favorites came from um, me and AU creator, Andrea Clausen, when she said that she just, when when she's feeling stressed, she just needs to find that joy, whatever it is. And she just writes fan fiction and just, she's like, it doesn't matter. It just brings me joy. And I, it's not important, it's not artistic. I'm going to give myself some joy and just run with it. And I love that. I and I think it's really important to whatever it is, whatever you can do, whether it's literally standing in front of people because that's because you don't like calling people on the phone or you don't like texting, but you know, you can do this. They're not going to get by you. Right. <laughs> or at least not easily. Or if it's just finding something creative, small to do that you can just kind of plug into and just kind of feel that. Absolutely. Um, Yanni. Yeah, so um, my first instinct um, when everything shut down and then with George Floyd, um, everything happening this year was that I was more encouraged and more inspired to keep doing my work. Um, because I began to realize that I did have a voice <laughs> And I did have something to say, and I had something that I felt people should hear. And I thought that people would appreciate hearing my voice. 
So um, I, I just felt more encouraged and more inspired and more dedicated to the work that I was doing. Um, there were times when I felt like because it brought me so much joy to be with the actors and, you know, working with the director and being in my writer's group and being with the Fable and Folly guy, you know, people um, that, and, you know, black audio dramas exist uh, that happened over the summer that I felt like, well, what, you know, I, I felt like, um, not guilty, but like, you know, this is just wonderful. I felt really embraced by so like such a wonderful community of people. Um, you know, like I said, the writers and, and everyone. So, um, yeah, I felt inspired and encouraged and more dedicated. And also it's just my nature just to keep going through it. I was just, I don't, I, I don't know how to explain it, but the way to get through it is to go through it. And so like what Richard was saying and like what Jeffrey and what everyone was saying is that making the effort day by day, step by step of just going through that process, going, doing the work, waking up, setting the routine, um, setting a timer for myself sometimes, writing out a list. That is what, um, because I ultimately believed and still believe um, is that once I get through it, I'll be able to look back and just say, wow, I, you know, there's this like um, gospel song that I grew up singing and it was something about um, a mountain and getting over the mountain. And you look back and you ask yourself, how did I ever get over, you know, get through that? And then it's at that moment that you can take your time and appreciate, you know, your faith, your strength, your community, your family, the, everyone who brought you through it. Um, but also like what Jeffrey was saying is that along the way, um, I've, I've had to become aware of self-care. I mean, that became a big thing this year, apparently. Um, and um, drink water and turn off, uh, you know, Twitter and go for my walks and reach out to family. Um, and um, so, yeah, I felt more overall, more dedicated and committed. Um, uh, just like uh, everyone else was like PJ was saying to my actors, to my crew, it was wonderful to to have them to uh, fall back on. And they wanted to they wanted something to do as well. So I was nice to be able to provide that for them. Another leader in action. And I also just want to note that when you said drink water, both PJ and Jeffrey did take sips. So I think that that's evident that you're leading, leading the charge. I was tempted to as well, but I, I decided not to. Um, thank you all so much. I, I am loving these answers. I'm, I'm feeling freshly inspired by every single thing that all of you are saying. And this has so far just been an incredibly positive experience. I think I'm going to try to an, ask one more question myself and then open it up to questions from folks who are watching the stream. Um, you've all released new shows or new seasons this year, and as the year unfolded, I'm curious if you found, given everything that's going on, the relationship with what you were releasing change at all because of the various crises? Did you rethink any of it? Did you make any changes with the events of this year in mind? Or was it sort of just like, we're going to keep it steady and rolling? And this time, I'm just going to open it up for folks to respond if that's okay. So it, it feels a little more spontaneous. So whoever wants to answer. Chaos. Um, I'll go. Um, for me, when everything that happened this year, it added like this sense of urgency. Um, you know, when I first started writing Visionaries, it definitely didn't have the same uh, themes as it has now. Like when first it was like, oh, here's this fantasy thing that I kind of want to do. And it's cool and it's playing with this and I'm inspired by this. But um, as I started getting deeper in it and then like, I'm like, wow, I could take on, you know, racism. I can take on the concept of privilege and I can still do it through this story that I had, that I had this, um, you know, natural 
uh, attraction towards this I uh, this this fantasy idea. I don't have to change it and turn it to a whole different piece. I can just kind of embed these things in the theme that I really want to touch on, and that just it went for it just became very important uh, in this year. And that's not because like obviously the racial injustice that's been going on for a long time. It's not like it just started in 2020, but what what's different was the people, the world responding to it. When not only here in the States, but when you saw um, in different countries, people responding to what happened to George Floyd. So that made me feel like, you know, this has to happen. And this was my first time putting out an audio drama. So there were a lot of dates. I'm, like, I'm gonna release it on this day. You know what, maybe I'll push it back. Maybe it's not <laughs> ready yet. And that happened so many times until I just kind of feel like I had this calling and I'm like, this is this is the moment this is the time where a lot of people are listening um in my lifetime i have not experienced that i i've experienced the racism bit but i have not experienced the people actually willing to listen bit so it just it it was this experience of just feeling like this has to be done this is the calling and um that's what changed for me so it added that sense of urgency yeah the largest civil rights movement ever right i mean essentially i mean i know that it's it's terrible that it's taken so much pain grief and suffering to get to this point but it is at least hopeful that it's here and that hopefully we can kind of rally behind that movement and keep it moving because we need it and also i just have to say visionaries feels like so much of the moment if you haven't listened to visionaries listen to it and you'll be like this 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 feels like it was wrought out of this year like for real like it just feels like it it be, and I mean this as a compliment, belongs in 2020 in a lot of ways. Um, Thanks, Jeff. Very, appreciate of the moment. Yeah, of course. Others? Feel free to jump in. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'll go. My, my relationship with my show has been very love-hate since everything started. Um, and, you know, I actually produced two shows. The, the smaller series, the microfiction series, um, Phantom Wise, which is about Alice's sister from Alice in Wonderland and what's going on with her um, while Alice is away. What, it kind of went off without a hitch, mostly thanks to A.R. Olivieri, just kind of taking the reins with the producer stuff. Um, but with, with Hit the Bricks, because it was so much bigger, it just felt like banging my head against the wall. And once Chad and I like really decided to just go for it, um, we kind of kept our head down until the show was up and we went back and we looked at everything. And you could see to the day when our engagement dropped because of... COVID, like literally people are listening, they're, you know, in their cars driving to work, they're doing their commute, COVID. Like the shutdowns killed our listening. And people still listen to the show, don't get me wrong, and I'm very thankful for it. But I was just like, man, this was just not our year. Um, and it, because we had our head down, there were little imperfections with the show that we were going to get back at once we released the full half season. Um, but because we didn't hear much feedback from anybody, Chad was like, well, I know everybody and I don't care. He, he's much more, um, he, he goes for it more than I do. He kind of took it to a bunch of different creators in the audio films, like, okay, this is the show I'm working on. We didn't hear anything. What do you think? Um, and Ponders, to their credit, actually broke everything down bit by bit. And we realized that like, we could totally restructure the show in a way that's easier for people to listen to if they're not commuting. So like, you don't have to listen to 50 minutes in one sitting. And also structurally, it's a lot more fulfilling. So we, we were actually like remastering the show in a big way. And the first episode came out two weeks ago and they're much smaller, but there's no content lost. In fact, um, there's new music, there's a new scene. Um, everything is spaced out a lot better. There are lots of little audio imperfections that were, that were zapping along the way. And it'll be going on for the next, a month and a half and and so it's, it's our way of saying like let's go back re-release it now that moods are getting a little bit better and actually make something that's not such a beast to tackle but is still the same show and hopefully like i, I think i'll feel a lot better about the way that the production went after we can kind of reclaim some of our time so to speak um yeah, I mean, I'm excited about it now, but I, I dreaded the whole thing for a long time. <laughs> I, I mean, I can speak for myself and say that I don't know what it was. It was really difficult for me to listen to fiction for a while. I, and I think it was the enormity of what was happening in the world. I had a hard time escaping. Even even like things like video games, television, I just couldn't engage with them in the same way. I was just sort of, I was in my head too much about what was happening. Um, so 
I understand like that it's tough. Like it's just, you know, watching that kind of engagement drop has to be heartbreaking, but it's just, you know, I, I admire you for sort of like not, not taking it laying down being like, no, we are going to, <laughs> people are going to listen to this and they're going to have a good experience by hook or by crook. Um, anyone else want to weigh in? You know, um, there's a kind of interesting thing I, I found with this year. Uh, so, um, with both Unwell and previously with Our Fair City, we work on really, really long timelines. Um, we, you know, kind of, we spend time outlining and then writing and then recording everything and then designing everything and then releasing it. So like, um, we had already, you know, gone through a big chunk of our writers meetings for season three of Unwell before uh, the pandemic hit. Um, we were actually just going into our like, final drafts reviews when we had to switch over to meeting online rather than meeting in person, uh, which was uh, deeply difficult for all of us. Um, it's really important for us to kind of, uh, with the writer's room, kind of have everyone together around the table, batting around ideas, eating together, uh, you know, just kind of bonding in that way. Um, so that was really tough. Um, but there is an advantage to the way in which it is kind of a behemoth in that like we we had our, our writing was in process we had scheduled um you know we had blocked out and scheduled uh just about all of our recording sessions we had to completely rework our recording but it was already like on actors calendars and so it wasn't so much that we had to start everything anything as just kind of twitch it and keep it rolling um so that was really, I think, really good for kind of being able to like keep the keep the monster rolling. Um, I'm realizing what I really want to talk about is all of the ways in which the season three scripts um, had changed in these small, beautiful, terrifying ways that reflected the kind of modern reality. Like we don't in season three. This is not a spoiler. We don't have a pandemic. We don't have a thing like that. Um, but I did see the way the writers were grappling with things change in, in really micro ways or in sometimes in macro ways. Um, there are pieces of this, this season that are going to be a lot scarier than anything that has showed up in the first two seasons of the show. There are ways that ideas are handled and engaged with that are very different. Um, you can you can feel a different kind of um, rage at at circumstance and struggling with circumstance coming through in some of the writing um, that are just I, I you know just just brilliant writers um, who I am so absurdly fortunate to get to work with. Um, seeing them work through some stuff with with 2020 has been really amazing i've been really lucky to get to to watch that happen and i can't tell you any specifics about it because uh it's still coming out so i can't wait <laughs> <laughs> but also i think what you're talking about kind of speaks to sort of what richard was talking about earlier about that sense of routine and process like your long process really helps that creative energy just keep going keep, keep the train moving kind of yep. right like routine is what it's all about in some ways and uh, next Tuesday, we go into writers' meetings for season four. So the train wow. continues to roll. Love it. More unwell is not a bad thing for anyone. Um, Yanni. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, so I wrote initially Harlem Queen, I think, in years ago. I want to say 2017. I was bopping around this idea. And because I realized that we were coming upon the 100 year anniversary of the launch of the Harlem Renaissance. Some people say it was the 20s, some say it's 24, but they're about. And so I wanted to show a lot of similarities from, um, uh, a lot of similarities between 1920s Harlem and 20, uh, you know, 2020s Harlem, 2018, 2019 Harlem, because I live here. And so um, in that respect, uh, I feel like I'm not going to take anything away from uh, people who have come before me, but there are still a lot of similarities between then and now. 
regarding the caste system. I'm big into the discussion of caste. I'm reading Isabel Wilkerson's book. So um, regarding uh, racism, sexism. Um, so the themes are still uh, resonating um, in today's uh, in today's world, in 2020. But also one of the characters in the story, Michelle, who learns about a big thing about her identity, was a very personal story for me because I, I didn't learn that I was white, obviously, but um, that I did learn about um, uh, my, something about my family. Um, and so I just thought it was interesting how uh, Michelle's facing her true identity, in my mind, also reflected this nation facing their true identity. Um, and it's, you know, the discomfort with that and not willing to uh, admit to it or face it. Um, it's challenging for a lot of people. Uh, so, um, yeah, I just think that's very interesting. I think we we can't, like I say, we have to go through it to get to look back and just say how how successful we've been. And so there's, uh, I I personally feel no other way. But anyway, with Michelle's story, it was a very personal story, and I began to realize how it could be seen as an as a universal story. And so, in telling that part of the story, I realized how important uh, I, uh, my voice as an artist was, is like how I was saying uh, earlier and how steadfast and how important my responsibility as an artist is to be authentic and honest, like the others were saying earlier, authentic, honest, vulnerable, um, accurate, um, and it isn't just little old me telling a little old story. It can have a huge impact on, you know, many people. And that's a, a responsibility that um, I did not fully internalize until this year. It's kind of going back and trying to find that truth. And also, I don't think there's anything, in, for me, there's nothing more cathartic than when you find something personal that you're struggling with yourself and that you can plug into sort of what's happening on a wider scale and, and you feel like you pull it off. Like that's, it's, it's, a, it's a refreshing feeling in a way, I think. Uh, and a painful one sometimes, but an important one. And, and I, I value moments like that when it, when it works, <laughs> when I feel like it works. Um, we are, this hour is zooming by no pun intended, even though we're not on Zoom. I am going to open it up for questions that might be in the live stream. And so I'm going to ask my good friend and colleague, Alexander, if we have any questions from the stream. Um, sorry, y'all. Oh. Sorry, I'm I'm failing at understanding <laughs> what I'm doing. Um, it's all good. Which which is not an infrequent occurrence. Um, where did my browser window go that I had all the questions written in? It literally va vanished when I clicked on it. Um, okay, so I'm going to work from memory um, since I have written them all down. But we have so many good questions. But you've already really touched on uh, most of them. Uh, one way or another, you've you've ranged so widely in everything you've covered, and it's been wonderful. Um, so I'm going to ask, I think, one of the the more positive questions to end on, since we don't have much time. Um, but it's, what is your favorite media for decompressing with? It used to be video games for me, and I can't do that anymore. I don't know what it is about this year, and that's all I'm going to say, because y'all are more important than me. Who, who would like to answer? I'll just say that um, I love reading. Um, that helps me so much. Just the quiet time, the, the just just the quiet time and the time with just being in my head. Um, this year, I've been listening to a lot of Nat King Cole. <laughs> I don't know why, but he's very uh, calming to me. Um, I've been listening to a lot of Ella Fitzgerald, just, um, I guess, the American Songbook. 
just a lot of, um, it just helps, comforts and calms me. Uh, I would say for me, um, I have spent a lot of 2020 getting very into modular synthesis, which is a way of making music with lots of different pieces of technology, some of which you know I've been learning to build myself and then collect connecting them with all of these wires everywhere into kind of unique patches that create pieces of music that are procedurally generated or or are played by you but are kind of unique in that moment and because of the ways you're patching the machines together and the ability to sit down in front of an instrument that doesn't have a screen and make this weird audio art that you can just kind of let wash over you and will never exist in the same way again and therefore there is no pressure to optimize or uh perfect is just deeply deeply relaxing to me um on a similar kind of note um sorry did i cut you off richard you're all good go ahead <laughs> okay sorry um something else that i that i do that's also in a similar vein of of being very meticulous um is pixel art i don't share it online but i it's something that i used to do a lot when i was a teenager and you know reading has failed me drawing has failed me um i don't get any joy from playing video games as often as i did uh so i, I went back to pixel art and i've been pumping out a lot lately which it's yeah um really meticulous probably bad for my eyes but that's where we're at um like jeff same thing like i used to play a lot of video games and that just completely went down so but I, if I find a show that is binge worthy where I would just plop down and watch it all day, that is probably like the best thing for me. Um, I like to get my binge on for sure. So um, that is that is something where literally the day will escape me and I'm like 10 episodes in, I'm just like, damn, well, I, I guess, you know, I can't do much, but it's nice for me to just kind of get so sucked in where I can just stop thinking about storylines plots or whatever the case or at least focus on someone else's storylines and plots so that's that's probably my thing imagine trying to live through this time when you couldn't binge watch tv when it was just you know oh, cable God. and that's it it would be challenging to say the least um i'm going to try to ha have one more question if possible i know we're running out of time but i'm going to try to squeeze one more in alexander uh okay uh let's see uh, we, we had one question that was, uh, we had a couple of questions about balancing productivity and self-care, but I think an interesting addendum to that question was, how do you address the guilt that can sometimes accompany self-care? Uh, and those questions are from Tal and William, respectively, and the previous one was from Rashika. That's a good question. Um, yeah, I that was challenging for me like how to how to like tell yourself it's okay like not to do this you don't have to write and i think the way i had to start looking at it was i i can speak for me like i where i'm at whatever podcasting like i i still need to do stuff to keep the lights on right so whatever job i do to keep the lights on i request days off, I request sick days, I, I'd like to take vacation. Why can't that same thing be applied to what I do for passion, right? Like, why can't I allow myself to have a sick day? And I had to start thinking like that. And I think because it's a project of our passion and we're just like trying to, we have the pressure of like, it's not just to do it, but it's to do it to lead to the next thing. So it feels like you have to give it every day your all your might, but it is, like how some people at other jobs get burned out. I think sometimes you need to be able to just step away, get some fresh eyes on it, get some fresh ears on it. And the best way to, for that to happen is just for self care and knowing like, okay, I, I need some time off. So that's, that was a way I had to look at it. Like it shouldn't be this way for this job, but this passion job of mine, I'm like this robot that can go all day, every day. That's just impossible. Uh, especially with everything that's going on today. Yeah, I feel that, do we do we have time, Jeff? Um, Absolutely. I feel that like, um, I'm a mother, I have a family, um, I have children, I've been raising children. Um, and um, as a 
as a mother, one thing that I learned is that in order for me to care for my family, I need to care for myself first. I mean, there's no, there's, it's, it all begins with me, <laughs> you know? Um, so uh, I, I, uh, I, yeah, I, I, I it, it, at first I was guilty about taking walks and runs, um, but I realized that if, like what Richard was saying, if further down the road, if I don't want to have a crisis, I need to balance things out now. I need to um, take this five minutes, this 10 minutes, this 20 minutes, so that I can continue, you know, two hours of work later on. So I feel like my self-care is actually um, helping <laughs> um, other people, actually helping my family, helping me create the work, helping my crew. Um, and, uh, you know, yeah, that's it. <laughs> I want to I wanna just echo and emphasize, I mean, uh, you know, all of my answers for, for so many of these questions are going to be based in community. Um, and like, yeah, the, the self-care is important because it allows you to remain engaged and remain uh, and, and continue to serve your community. I think also part of the way to, to address the like, how practically do you avoid the like doubt of like, or, or, or guilt is, is build a community that you trust enough to check in with and say, Hey, like, I am feeling like I need this. Um, and, and trusting that you have someone who will not just rubber stamp it or give you an answer that you don't trust, uh, someone that can say like, no, I can see that, you know, you have spent this time doing this. And so you need to unplug uh, or to, or to binge something or to, to, uh, recharge or, or to tell you that, um, the work you're doing, um, is important or is or is not important and and help you refocus on the things that are important because so often i do think that also not just um uh uh self-care but like sometimes the work you get into can get unproductive and can get self-destructive if you don't have people outside saying hey like let me help you retarget here um so having a community that you trust is just so important. And that happens on a really intensely local, I, I, I don't think, I'm not speaking of like a, a wider audio drama community. I'm talking about the four people who are there, you know, right with you, um, whether they're remote or in person with you. <laughs> the people who are going to get you through the winter. <laughs> I mean, we're, we're big on that in Chicago. You know, yeah. once, the, once that barometer hits negative 30, uh, we all kind of uh, huddle together and keep each other alive. I'm going to open it up for PJ. Did you have anything? We have time. Um, I mean, I just wanted to say really quickly, I agree with what everyone is saying. Um, keeping involved means that you have to also Keep yourself present and take care of yourself and that would you know require going through all the motions taking care of your health both physically and mentally i also um i just kind of want to like i don't know like preface as well that like self-care the way that everyone in this chat has been talking about it is not the same way as like the internet has kind of co-opted it and it's important to remember that the original self-care movement was mostly about people of color particularly black women who are expected to do everything and need to be reminded to literally take care of themselves at like the base level and not feel guilty about having some time to focus on themselves so they can take care of their family i, I just think that's important to say okay <laughs> especially in the context of what we were celebrating at the top of the hour the election which overwhelmingly would not have been won if it weren't for black women i think so um i think that's an important caveat for sure um uh, I, Jay, pj i didn't even know that about self-care <laughs> the history of self-care i'm a black woman so i'm just so impressed that that came out of that movement um yeah thank you for sharing that i, I mean i'm glad that it found its way around um but yeah that's i, I just don't want it to be a bunch of like Tumblr posts about bath bombs when it's 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 so much more important than that. 
I shouldn't laugh at that as hard as I am. Um, I, I, I got to kick this back to Alexander for outro, but I just want to thank you all for this incredible hour. It's been inspiring. It's made me feel a hundred times better than I even did at the start of the hour. And I was already kind of feeling pretty good then. So thank you so much. I don't know why I'm getting texts. I turn notifications off. Thank you so much for all of your words and inspiration and for your art. And please, all of you keep doing it. Keep doing your art. It's beautiful and you're beautiful. And if you're watching this, please keep doing your art as well. Or if you're not making art yet, find your story and tell it. That's the biggest piece of advice I can tell you. And without further ado, Alexander, take us away. Okay. Uh, so I, I want to say first off uh, that uh, we do have two of the shows represented here today appearing on the PodTales showcase. That is our podcast feed. Visionaries will be in the showcase on November 25th and Hit the Bricks will be in the showcase on November 30th. Uh, but please also do go check out Unwell. Do go check out Harlem Queen. They are wonderful shows. Um, I'm a little biased on one of them, uh, but they, they are just joys to listen to. Um, and thank you to Jeff Van Driesen and PJ Blankenship and uh, uh, Jeffrey Gardner uh, and Yahani and David. Uh, and thank you, Brandon. Uh, you have been a wonderful addition to this. Um, and so the this session is part of PodTales 2020, three Wecken, Weckons, oh boy. Three weekends of programming brought to you in partnership with the Sarahs, the Sarah Lawrence College International Audio Fiction Award. Uh, for a full list of sessions, visit podtales.org, podtales.org. And be sure to subscribe to Podtales on the Podchaser of your choice. Uh, to find the podcast showcase selections we'll be featuring from now through the end of the month on our feed. As a reminder, Podtales 2020 is completely free. Uh, we believe in making the resources we're creating available and accessible to all. If you like what we're doing here, please consider supporting us on Patreon at podtail at, at patreon.com slash podtails. And that is all. <laughs>